This is purely a journalistic point of view. Nothing more has been said in this video other than that of which has been reported by various media sources and backed up with sources seen at the end of this video. In 2001, a dying world championship wrestling was sold to the WWF, changing the landscape of wrestling forever. However, there were plans to save the company, with Eric Bischoff masterminding a pay-per-view that he helped would relaunch the company. The pay-per-view was called Big Bang and has gone down in history as one of wrestling's biggest what-ifs. Join us now as Behind the Titan Tron examines the WCW Revival pay-per-view that almost happened. WCW had always had the backing of media mogul Ted Turner. Billionaire Ted had always seen professional wrestling as part of the reason he'd been able to build up Superstation TBS into the cable success story known as Turner Broadcasting System. Thus, wrestling always held a special place in his heart, and many believed that as long as he was around, wrestling would always have a home on his network. However, a merger and a miscalculation changed things dramatically. In January 2000, the media landscape changed when two media giants merged. As detailed in the death of WCW, Time Warner CEO Gerald Levine struck a $183 billion deal with America Online's Steve Case to merge the two companies into what they believed would be the ultimate media superpower. Turner ended up with 3% of the new company's stock and a mostly figurehead position as vice chairman. Suddenly, his days of spending millions at will on frivolities like professional wrestling were finished. In his place were boards of directors, financial analysts and CFOs looking at the bottom line. These men were going to do something that no one had ever had, make WCW fiscally responsible for its actions. WCW was going to have to do something it didn't have a history of doing, making a profit. Although the company had done well with the New World Order angle and a time afterwards, it had rarely been a profit maker and recent years were no exception. As detailed in the book Sex, Lies and Headlocks, Ted Turner made a rare miscalculation or at least a misjudgment about the reverence with which a new generation of internet moguls regarded him. As the largest stockholder in Time Warner, he gave his approval to a merger with AOL, only to find out in April that the new owners wanted him gone. Gerald Levine, the chairman of Time Warner, told Turner that the networks that bore his name would be now reporting to the chief operating officer of AOL. With a new sheriff in town, rumours immediately circulated that AOL Time Warner was looking to drop the money pit known as WCW. Eric Bischoff had considered buying WCW but was initially rebuffed by Time Warner's executive Brad Siegel. When Siegel changed his mind, Bischoff sought out a group of investors as he didn't have the funds to purchase the company. Bischoff's friend Jason Harvey directed him to Brian Bedoy of Fusent Media, a company which had acquired sports content and used it for the classic sports network. Fusent then sold the company to ESPN in a lucrative transaction. According to Bischoff's memoir, Controversy Creates Cash, they decided they wanted to take a run at it. Our arrangement called for me to own part of the company. I would run the wrestling and TV side, leaving Brian to handle the business side. He was far more qualified there than I was. Brian and Steve were part of Allen & Company, a venture capital company, so we brought them in. We made a presentation to Warburg Pincus, another venture capital firm. In the end, we had a package worth $67 million. The purchase looked to be imminent until the WWF expressed interest in buying WCW. According to Bischoff, AOL used creative bookkeeping to sweeten the deal. Bischoff and company were bypassed and the WWF was actively pursued. That is until Viacom, the television network which had recently signed a long-term television deal with the WWF, 
told the corporation they did not want a wrestling program to air on a rival network. The WWF pulled out and Brad Siegel asked Bischoff if there was still interest in purchasing WCW. After being burnt once, there was trepidation about pursuing a purchase, but Siegel convinced Bischoff and his business partners that the deal was worth pursuing. There was no denying that WCW had sank to new lows, losing ratings and more importantly, losing money. However, Eric Bischoff was determined to salvage what he had once helped turn into a wrestling juggernaut. Bischoff set several goals which he felt would help overhaul the dying brand. First, he would put WCW on hiatus. In Bischoff's mind, the WCW brand had been dragged through the mud for so long that it had to die and be reborn if it was going to be worth anything. It had to go away and then come back, looking and feeling completely different. Another decision was to end house shows. House shows had been a big money loser once WCW's popularity sagged. Bischoff also intended to relocate the company to Las Vegas, holding its shows at the Hard Rock Cafe, a smaller venue that could hide the smaller crowd and hopefully be filled with fans who cared about the product. In a 2016 interview, former WCW creative and production executive John Laurinaitis explained, The plan was that WCW would move to Las Vegas and do weekly tapings out of the Hard Rock Cafe, which was building a 3,000 square foot arena at the time. Part of the company would have been based out of Los Angeles. According to the death of WCW, Bischoff also looked at ending guaranteed contracts and bringing in younger and more affordable stars. Although this meant WCW would likely lose performers such as Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash, the company had been building up other stars such as Scott Steiner and Booker T. After much negotiating, the deal was made. With one caveat, Turner Broadcasting Systems would retain a minority interest and long-term programming rights. This meant TBS would have a 10-year option to air WCW. On the 11th of January 2001, Bischoff and his business partners held a press conference with Brad Siegel, announcing the deal. The entertainment newspaper Variety reported there were hints that Fusion was going to negotiate with the WWF about co-promoting pay-per-views. However, the WCW deal was subject to due diligence, which meant that the actual deal would not be completed for weeks to come. In the meantime, Bischoff laid out his plans. His initial idea to put WCW on hold after February's Super Bowl pay-per-view was set aside when Time Warner told him he couldn't, pointing out that Time Warner would lose money to advertisers if there was no wrestling programs airing on its channels. Bischoff changed course, deciding to run an angle where WCW world champion Scott Steiner ran through the promotion's baby faces, leading to a showdown with Diamond Dallas Page at Greed, its 18th March 2001 pay-per-view. The next night, WCW's new owners would emerge, putting the show on hiatus now that they wielded control of WCW. A pay-per-view relaunch entitled Big Bang would begin the new era of WCW. Bischoff went about assembling his team for the new WCW. With ECW about to give up the ghost, Bischoff reached out to ECW announcing legend Joey Styles. Styles recalls, Eric sent me to meet with Brian Bedoy in Manhattan to talk about what I would do for WCW. I would be the lead announcer and I would work in digital media. I did not agree to do this with Eric until it was obvious that ECW was finished. As for a color commentator, Styles remembers, I suggested Don Callis, who was my color commentator for ECW pay-per-views. To Eric, he and I were a very good team. I heard rumors that my other announcer was going to be Jerry the King Lawler, who at the time was not with WWE. Of course, announcers were only a portion of the crew. What of the wrestlers? Given Bischoff's cuss-cutting measures, it seemed unlikely he'd keep big-ticket players like Hulk Hogan and Kevin Nash. However, as mentioned earlier, stars like Booker T and Scott Steiner seemed ready for the main event. There was also Diamond Dallas Page, a close friend of Bischoff's who remained a popular performer with WCW fans. However, Page was ambivalent about staying with WCW. It was really important to me 
because I only had a couple of years left in my career period and I wanted to end my career in WWE but my buddy was buying the company WCW. I can't turn around and screw him. With the players in place, Eric Bischoff was ready to see if he could capture lightning in a bottle again. However, forces beyond his control were moving against him, leading to both the death of Bischoff's plans for WCW and the company itself. Although the deal had been signed, the due diligence involved in examining the company was raising alarms amongst Fusion executives. The death of WCW covers how Fusion's concerns grew. Fusion's lead investor, Warburg Pincus, began to realize that this was a company that was in deep, deep debt, with tons of lawsuits on its hands and a fan base departing in droves. In fact, the only real assets the company had included, a name that had been devalued by years of bad booking, several high-priced superstars who weren't cutting the mustard, a large tape library, and the fact that once upon a time, it had a hot run. These were not generally considered valuable assets. This led to them lowering its bid from an estimated 60 to 70 million dollar range in half with a down payment of 5.7 million dollars and a 20 year payment schedule to cover the remainder. The true deal breaker came when an executive arrived on the scene for Turner Broadcasting. Jamie Kellner took on the position of chairman and chief executive officer after a successful run at the WB. Kellner had helped the WB become successful after targeting the young female demographic with shows such as Dawson's Creek and Gilmore Girls. He intended to do the same at Turner, which meant wrestling had no place in his plans for TBS. Kellner set about cancelling both Nitro and Thunder. Ironically, Bischoff had not planned on keeping WCW at Turner for long. According to Diamond Dallas Page, Bischoff had hoped to move WCW from TBS. Eric was really excited about taking over WCW, but I know he did not want to keep the show on Turner. Eric at the time saying, get them to give us three months and I will get another network to pay for the show. What network wants to buy a show that's been cancelled? With no TV outlet to sell advertising on or to promote pay-per-views, WCW was effectively dead. Although he tried to find stations to air WCW, he was unsuccessful, with USA and Fox turning him down. On the 19th March 2001, Eric Bischoff phoned Nitro with an enigmatic message. Many of you may know that for the past six months, I've been working with a group of people whose goal it was and is to acquire World Championship Wrestling and to grow it once again to become a competitive, dominant wrestling organization worldwide. Bischoff said with a defeated tone, but recently we've hit a couple of roadblocks that might be, in fact, brick walls. Fusion pulled out of the deal on the 20th of March 2001, ending Bischoff's plans for WCW and its relaunch show Big Bang. Once you took the television part out of the deal, it really wasn't worth anything. Without television, the company wasn't worth anything to us, so we walked away from it. In Bischoff's memoir, he notes, The deal went from something worth roughly $67 million to something worth $67. As wrestling fans know, the WWF swooped in, buying WCW's copyrights and tape library for a song, rumored to be anywhere from three to five million dollars. WCW's Big Bang pay-per-view would never be and has become enshrined as one of wrestling's biggest hypotheticals. Would it have revived WCW or merely postponed what some saw as its inevitable demise? What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments down below on whether you think WCW would have survived. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Behind the Titan Tron. Please of course leave a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you next time with some more wrestling content.